Good afternoon. I'd like to thank Sages for the invitation to present. Today, I'll be discussing port oral endoscopic pyloromyotomy for medical refractory gastroparesis. We have no disclosures for this presentation. Gastroparesis can be a medically challenging condition with procedural intervention reserved for those patients with medical refractory gastroparesis. A new procedure that has been proposed for the management of patients with medical refractory gastroparesis is the poor oral endoscopic pyloromyotomy, also known as the POP procedure. At our institution, the POP procedure is performed in the operating room under general anesthesia. The first step is the development of a submucosal tunnel. In order to do this, methylene blue is injected approximately five centimeters proximal to the pylorus. Next, using a triangular tip knife, a transverse mucosotomy is made at the site of previous methylene blue injection. Using the TT knife and the endoscopic cap, the submucosal tunnel is then developed along the lesser curvature of the stomach through the pyloric channel and into the first portion of the duodenum. Next, the pyloric muscles are divided. This has begun approximately two centimeters proximal to the pylorus. Finally, the endoscope is withdrawn from the submucosal tunnel, ensuring adequate hemostasis, and endoscopic clips are used to close the mucosotomy. Because this is a new procedure, the safety and feasibility of POP remains relatively unknown. Therefore, the purpose of our study was to investigate the safety, feasibility, and short-term outcomes for patients undergoing poor oral endoscopic pyloromyotomy for medical refractory gastroparesis. The safety of the procedure was defined as the ability to successfully complete the POP procedure without gastric or duodenal perforation, intraluminal hemorrhage, or procedure-related death. The feasibility of the procedure was defined as post-procedure symptom relief as determined by improvement in gastric emptying retentions, gastric cardinal symptom index scores, and the number of medications required for patient symptom alleviation. At our institution, the gastric emptying study is a four-hour non-extrapolated study. It uses a radial labeled solid material, and the normal uh, retention percentage at four hours is defined as zero to 10%. The gastric cardinal symptom index includes nine questions, three related to nausea and vomiting, four related to postprandial fullness, and two related to bloating. Patients are asked to rate their symptoms with a range of zero, meaning they have no symptoms at all, to five, meaning that they have the most severe symptoms. In order to determine the safety and feasibility of the POP procedure, all patients with a diagnosis of medical refractory gastroparesis who underwent POP at the Cleveland Clinic main campus from January 2016 through January 2017 were prospectively followed. Descriptive statistics were used to identify the cause of gastroparesis previous interventions, operative details, and 30-day outcomes. Short-term improvements were then determined based on comparison between pre- and post-POP gastric emptying studies, gastric symptom index scores, as well as patient medication regimens. At our institution, the workup of a patient suspected of gastroparesis occurs using a multidisciplinary approach. This includes a team of a psychiatrist, dietitian, gastroenterologist, and general surgeon. All patients undergo an upper endoscopy to rule out distal obstruction. They also undergo either a gastric emptying study or smart pill study for the diagnosis of gastroparesis. Should there be a concern for malnutrition, consideration is made for enteral access either prior to or at the time of intervention for gastroparesis. A total of 47 patients underwent POP at our institution from January 2016 through January 2017. 27 patients had idiopathic gastroparesis, 12 patients had diabetic gastroparesis, and eight patients had post-surgical gastroparesis. A total of 41 of these patients had undergone previous interventions. 21 of these patients had previous enteral access, 16 patients had a previously paced gastric stimulator, and 28 patients had undergone injection of their pylorus with Botox. With respect to safety outcomes, the average operative time was 41 minutes, and the average length of hospital stay was one day. 
No patient experienced a gastric or duodenal perforation, intraluminal hemorrhage, or procedure-related death. With respect to feasibility outcomes, there is a statistically significant improvement in all three components of the gastric cardinal symptom index score, as well as the total average score. There is also a statistically significant decrease in the four-hour gastric retention studies. Finally, there was a statistically significant decrease in the number of anti-emetic medications taken by our patients. In conclusion, this is the largest case series to date to detail short-term outcomes following POP for medical refractory gastroparesis. Our study demonstrates the safety and feasibility of the POP procedure as a promising and new first-line therapy for medical refractory gastroparesis. This paper is open for discussion. Kevin Revis, Portland, Oregon. Um, as much difficulty as we have getting POEM covered by third-party pairs, POP has even been more challenging for us. How are you able to get 20 third-party pairs to cover POP in your patients? Uh, 47. Huh? 47. 47. <laughs> Kevin, sorry, I'm going to help out a little bit. Yeah. Um, John Rodriguez from Cleveland Clinic. Uh, you know, so far we haven't had any issues. Uh, we've done all these cases in the operating room under general anesthesia. We're using uh, CPT code for pyloroplasty with an endoscopic modifier, and we haven't had any issues with coverage. I need to move to Ohio. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> John? How do you handle peristalsis? You know, one of the things we take for granted in POEM is it's an aperistaltic organ, right? But when you start doing the opening of the gastric mucosa, we found that peristalsis keeps pushing the scope out. So do you have any tricks or tips to help prevent that problem from happening? Because they tend to be hyperperistaltic in gastroparesis. Again, you know, we in, initially in our series, I think um, a lot of these patients with truly medical refractory gastroparesis, we haven't really had any issues with hyperperistalsis. Um, we've had a couple of patients that we used, uh, you know, narcotics in the operating room to try to slow down the peristaltic wave. But I think once you get the initial mucosotomy done and, and you get the scope into the tunnel, it really hasn't been an issue for us. And, and that's why we prefer the lesser curve approach. I think most of the series out there have described the greater curvature approach, and, and I think for, for that type of uh, endoscopic position, it's a little bit more challenging. Uh, Prashant Sinova at NYU, uh, congratulations on a great case series. Um, uh, gastroparesis is, is really challenging, um, so I'm glad you gave us some, some detail uh, about the valuation. Um, but over the few years, uh, in a number of years, we've seen different modalities uh, been proposed surgically to address gastroparesis, and intermediate and long-term outcomes aren't always the most satisfactory. Um, going forward, would you consider a randomized control trial, and if so, how would you, what would you look at for a control group? So that's a good question. I mean, I think the, you know, um, I think gastroparesis in general is a challenging disease. And these patients often get referred for surgical management, which, as you state, um, has mediocre to you know mild kind of outcomes. Um, I think if you're going to look at the POP procedure um, for long-term success, you would have to do a sham procedure um, where you have two kind of arms, one who actually gets the POP procedure and one who does not, to follow them long-term. Do I know if that will happen? I don't know. Um, one technical question. Um, we've tried that. We did one case. Uh, I was talking with the Pittsburgh group. They did 10 cases. And our experience was that we couldn't go into the duodenal portion with the tunnel as we do in the poem, that you can clearly pass uh, the G-junction because the risk of perforation there is high. So mainly you're fishing the fibers of the pylorus from above. How do you manage to pass into the, how long do you pass with the tunnel? Because your graphics there show that you pass into the duodenum. How long do you pass and do you take yeah. the cap off or? So we actually um, developed the submucosal tunnel into the duodenum. Um, we 
kind of, we encountered the same issues because the duodenum sort of sits at a 90 degree angle to the pylorus. And so we actually don't go into the duodenum when we're dividing the muscles anymore in order to avoid that. Great, we're just a little bit over time. I wanna thank you and thank all of our presenters for an excellent session today. Um,